So instead of waiting for the official opening of the land um, around the Ohio River, a lot of settlers from the east, from the coast, um, just kind of snuck into the territories and claimed the land that they wanted, which was actually illegal. Um, and Congress, because it realized that this was just going to cause more conflicts with the natives, Congress is going to force them off the land in 1785, um, basically calling on the militias again and saying, go and evict them because we cannot afford to start a war with the natives. Um, and so they're going to leave for a little bit, and then the troops are like, okay, things seem secure, they're all good, the, the settlers are gone, um, and so the troops leave. And the settlers just came back. Uh, this is ultimately going to force Congress to revise Jefferson's territorial plan, um, basically to the point, you, you can read this yourselves, but what it did was it would take a little area of land, divide it into parcels, and then as different territories were added, people could come into these, it was these patchwork grids is what they called them, um, and they were given certain parcels um, that they, again, had to pay for. And you could, I mean, this even tells you, you can see them from the air, so that's kind of cool. Um, and then what they did is every so many parcels of land, they would establish schools and churches or whatnot. And this is why when you fly over these states, like I grew up right about here, so, you know, I, I know what I'm talking about here. When you fly over them, you look down, it looks like a giant grid, and that's because it literally was gridded out to determine who could get what land. Um, and then, you know, income was part of the determination. Um, all these different things went into effect. But these parcels were attempted to be agreed on by the natives. So the Congress would send representatives to sit down with the natives and say, all right, if we had this chunk of land and we parceled it out, you know, what would be a fair parcel distribution and how much of this do you want and how much can we give? So, I mean, at least it was an early attempt to kind of try to form some land agreements with the natives, but we're just going to take advantage of all this and ultimately further drive them west. Um, but it is important, you know, that we acknowledge, yes, we tried at some point. Um, there's a temporary government that's put into those territories. Um, and basically the idea is that eventually, again, once you hit that 20,000 people who came, uh, three to five states were eventually going to be carved from the territory. And at this point, the idea was that slavery was going to be prohibited. By 1787, uh, you know, the peace treaty has been signed, the Treaty of Paris has been signed, and so we decide we can start addressing the question of slavery. Um, but instead of having self-governance in these areas where each territory got to establish their own government and their own laws, um, what was happened was that the Articles of Confederation would appoint a court of judges and a governor uh, to kind of oversee the area until the population of that region had grown to 5,000 free white males. Right Now again, you're like, well, but slavery, yes. That doesn't mean they didn't still smuggle the slaves in. And they didn't care about the women and they didn't care about, um, honestly, they didn't really care about the poor guys except for when they were counting this either. Um, the 5,000 free white men could then petition uh, that governor who had been appointed by the Congress to create a, a legislative assembly uh, that would have the power to then govern itself. So it was basically the idea that Congress would create a temporary government when enough people got there then they could petition to create their own government. Um, this territory eventually is going to be divided into states such as Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Um, and in terms of Ohio, because it's where we're from, Arthur St. Clair uh, was the president of the Ohio Company to be the territory's first governor. So this is important, uh, an AP type of question on this would be something like um, westward expansion, and it would talk about westward expansion, and you would say a variety of conflicts between the natives and the settlers over land, money, power, eventually resulted in a temporary compromise that allowed the colonists to create their own governments that would eventually be a part of the national government, but the natives had no say in that government. Free white males... That excludes the natives in those regions. Keep that in mind. 
Um, in terms of politics, the, there was a lot of political mobilization during the Revolutionary War. You know, the whole pre-revolution revolution was driven by politics. The Sons of Liberty was a political group. And so what's going to happen is the idea of politics playing an important part in American identity is really going to be born and continued. Uh, there are different political parties, different political stances, but really America is going to be a country of politics. Uh, a greater proportion of the population began to participate in elections. Again, white male property owners, but still, um, in the different legislative assemblies that were created during the revolution, and then in the Articles of Confederation and the Continental Congresses. You're going to have tons of people flocking out to be, uh, you know, very active as delegates in these types of um, assemblies. Many of the delegates were, honestly, at this point, rather poor in that they came from farming communities. Uh, they didn't own a ton of property. They lacked formal education, but they saw this as their opportunity to try to level the playing ground with the American nobilities, if you will. Um, originally, the political debates revolved around whether you were going to be a loyalist or a patriot. Uh, after the war, it's going to basically there's not going to be that debate anymore. There's no point to debate, are you a, a patriot or a loyalist? The loyalists are gone. So now the debates are going to take the appearance of, well, what should the new government look like? So political parties are going to shift their focus. Um, during the revolution in 1776, there was a pamphlet, and remember, the more of these you can just toss out there in essays as support, the better. There's a pamphlet entitled, The Peoples Are the Best Governors, that said power should be held in a single elected assembly, one body where the people have the right to vote, so democracy, um, with no property qualifications for voting or holding office, with the governor serving only to carry out the wishes of the people, this is very Locke in terms of enlightenment theories, right, and that judges are popularly elected and reviewed by the assembly, a checks and balance that Montesquieu would favor. We're going to do a little miniature unit on the Constitution after this, and you're going to see more of this come into play. But basically the idea is that the people are going to have a say. They're going to have a say in their taxes, in their military, in their schooling, in their churches, freedom of religion. Um, they're going to have a say in their economy. And the national government was going to just serve as this puppet master, if you will. Right? It was kind of like we're all marionettes that can act and move on our own, and the government just kind of helps to orchestrate that whole thing. Um, conservatives are going to be the Whigs, who argue that you need to separate government from popular control. You don't want to have a mass of uneducated people trying to govern. It's just going to be too hard. Um, and that instead you should have a strong executive, and you should have an upper house. Um, and so now you're going to have people, maybe we should have property qualifications. Because you really don't want to have, you know, majority rules is that the best at all times? Is the majority always smart? Are they always educated? Do they always know what they're talking about? Um, and so this is going to be the new uh, birth of political parties. Once you're no longer discussing, are we a loyalist or are we a patriot? Now you're discussing, well, should we have a democracy or should we have a republic? Democracy ruled by the people, all the people, or a republic ruled by elected representatives. Clearly, we should know the, the, the spoiler alert. We settled for a compromise of both. Um, 14 states are going to ultimately sit down and meet, um, and they are each going to create their own constitution, 13 original colonies in Vermont. Um, they're going to adopt their own state constitutions right as the, the war comes to an end, and each one is going to um, consist of debates, again, between democracy versus republic. In Pennsylvania, for example, the majority of conservatives had been loyalists. So the government is going to be very democratic, um, which I know seems kind of counterintuitive. But the idea was that the loyalists are gone. And so now you're going to have people say, well, they had all had their power because they had been appointed. We don't like that. So we should have our power because we're people and we live here. Um, within Pennsylvania, they had a unicameral assembly, one house, unicameral, uni means I. One House Assembly, um, elected annually by all free male taxpayers, open the public, roll call vote, so you would stand there, I, nay, oppose, same sign. Um, and then they had an elect 
an elected executive committee instead of a governor. So instead of one dude in charge, it was like an oligarchy. You had this group of people who all kind of would work together as the head of the Pennsylvania government. And that's just an example. Each state kind of did things differently. And this goes through, um, you know, and you can hit pause and you can read through this. Please do. I, I just don't feel like you need me to read this to you. But it goes through and explains how each state um, is really going to create their first constitutions. Maryland's constitution, written by conservatives, they had property requirements. New York's constitution um, is going to be kind of a blend of the two. Um, and its goal was to try to reflect as much of the conservative ideals as possible. Um, so you can take a minute, pause me rambling, read through this, you know, see if it makes sense. Uh, here's another one. Virginia is going to go through and it's going to show you. I, I just like this picture. This doesn't have anything to do with this page. I like, I like fives. I got nothing. Um, but the Virginia Declaration of Rights... Uh, it's going to be written by a dude named George Mason, and it basically says, hey, you know what? We all have rights, and we have the right to have those rights protected, and that they can't just be taken away, and for too long, our basic human rights have been taken away. So we, as a state, need to come up with a constitution that protects those, they're called your unalienable rights, right? Life, liberty, and then depending who you ask, happiness or property. It just depends. Um, and he's like, no, you know what? We should all have these. And it ensures civil liberties, such as a trial by jury, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, speedy trial, no cruel and unusual punishment. All those basic ideals in the Enlightenment, Mason's going to embrace that. Um, other state constitutions are going to do similar. Some are going to have um, very specific delineations of their basic rights. Others are going to become much more broad. Eventually, these are going to become our Bill of Rights in the Constitution when we get rid of the Articles of Confederation. Here's our fly, uh, Thomas Jefferson. In 1776, the Constitution in New Jersey, um, accidentally, in the way that it phrased uh, its voting, its suffrage rights, granted women the right to vote. And so men freaked out, and they had to go back and rewrite it. So that was just kind of a funny little, I always think that's funny, like, oops, sorry, we just said that all citizens have the right to vote, and women were citizens, so they could vote. That only lasted for a couple of weeks. Because um, it's important to note, even though women fought in the revolution, their, their role in society wasn't really changed um, pretty much at all. But women wanted change, so that's important. Jefferson, who is going to be active in the Virginia House of Delegates after drafting the Declaration, um, is really going to start abolishing... Um, some of the inheritance laws and start pushing for um, laws that try to equalize particularly the differences between men and women. So he did kind of start to address it, but not in much detail. Um, he also wanted to address freedom of religion. Many estates still tried to stay closely related to their religion in terms of their um, state constitutions. Um, you know, stuff from what you were allowed to dress, um, when you were allowed to work, those types of laws. But Jefferson's going to continue to make reforms. They're not going to pass, but he's going to push forward all the way through, even through his own presidency, um, that are going to be reforms in terms of society at large, um, trying to solve some of the questions of education, slavery, and these types of issues. Um, and speaking of slavery, African Americans, yeah, they were here. But they didn't get freedom. And this whole, I mean, you can read these. I'm not going to read it to you. The whole Revolutionary War is people wanting to fight for independence. As we continue to maintain a huge amount of slavery within our own states. And this is really going to upset the slaves. They're not stupid. They realize this. Um, and so they really are going to start pushing for their own independence. It's not going to work. And after the advent of the cotton gin and cotton becomes more profitable, slavery is going to increase and it's going to become the central issue for American politics for about the next 75 years. Um, and you can see examples of where you have people like Benjamin Banneker, who, you know, invented a clock, an astronomer, mathematician, these geniuses, Phyllis Wheatley, none of them are going to get the respect they deserved because while white man is fighting for independence, they're ignoring the non-white man.